everybody. I think this is working. Today we are going to start out uh, <clears throat> by answering a couple of questions that I got from viewers. And then I'm going to launch right into answering your live questions. So if you do have a question for me and you've been waiting to ask it, now is the time. Jot it in the chat wherever you are, and I will answer it as soon as I can get to it. All right? So we also have with us today the lunted Joktan. <laughs> okay, so with that said, let's see what we have to start out today. Oh, we're going to be beginning with how to answer questions that we believe are too personal or personal attacks at work. Uh, I had somebody write and ask me, what do I do when somebody asks me? <laughs> I have a coworker who's leaving and they're asking me for my phone number. And I've stalled them out as long as I can. And I need to either give them my phone number, a fake phone number, or an answer. And here is the answer to that. Especially in this day and age, if you are uncomfortable giving somebody your phone number, tell them, I don't give out my phone number, <laughs> period. You know, and if they say, well, I heard you give it to that person, I don't give out my phone number. You don't have to explain who you give it out to, who you don't give it out to, or what your criterion is when you are deciding who to or not to give your phone number. So if you find something to be personal to you and that's too personal to give it to you, just tell people, I don't give that out, or that's personal, and leave it at that. Now, when somebody makes a personal attack, for example, I had somebody ask, how do I respond when my supervisor tells my old supervisor that I'm difficult to work with. What's that? Now, I would not give them a lesson on what is professional and not professional communication in the workplace. For example, if you are a supervisor and you're saying to another supervisor in front of the employee about whom you are speaking that they are a difficult employee, I suggest you take one of my courses here. <laughs> but in response to that, what do I say if I hear somebody say I'm a difficult person to work with? I would check your approach. And the, the reason, by the way, can you hear me? Everybody can hear me okay? The reason I would check your, uh, or my approach is, when somebody makes a comment like that, you're a difficult person to work with, you're a difficult employee, that is a vague statement. That is a personal attack. Even though they might be talking about, I'm a difficult customer service representative, I'm a difficult employee, I'm a difficult supervisor. That is a personal attack. And the reason is, because there's nothing specific about it. There's no substance. If somebody were to say to an incoming supervisor of mine, and they're the outgoing supervisor, watch it for, you know, watch out for Dan. He's a difficult employee. I might say something along these lines. <laughs> now that's quite a personal remark to make when I'm trying to keep things here very professional. And if you could tell me something more specific, for example, am I difficult? to give instruction to? Am I uh, not able to receive corrections? Am I not able to receive feedback? What is it specifically that makes me difficult? Then that transforms the message when they can be specific about it from a personal attack, such as you're difficult to work with, to a specific workplace criticism, such as they don't respond well to feedback. Now I can hear that and work on it, and I would appreciate that feedback. As much as you have, bring it on, because that's not a personal attack, that is a specific criticism for the workplace. So just make sure that when we are at work, we're keeping the communication on a very professional level, which means specificity is always the name of the game. Instead of saying things such as, I like that, I think that's way better. <laughs> you know, I think, I think that is a better proposal. I wanna say something specific every time. If I'm gonna open up my mouth, I want to say something that adds value to my position, to my department, such as, I think that is a more customer-focused approach that we would be taking if we went with proposal number B. I think that is a more cost-effective approach if we went to proposal number C, or, you know, letter C. So always be specific. Keep your communication professional. And if you do that, it will be above, beyond reproach. And I always want to shoot for that to keep my communication at work, especially beyond reproach. I'm not really sure what the opposite of beyond reproach would be, if that would be with, within reproach. I don't know, we'll check on that. But I'm going to read a couple of questions if I can <laughs> find them. Okay, I like what you said in another video, stop taking things personally. Oh, and now Joktan, I'm having a little challenge here. <laughs> Yes, okay, yes. Dice, 
jefe. Sin embargo, la gerencia no siguió sus reglas de nueva contratación, que se supone debe estar en el puesto durante seis meses antes de cualquier ascenso en su puesto en la empresa. Ok. Lo ascendieron de puesto Ajá. antes de lo que decía el contrato, cuando él ya había cumplido los requisitos. Ok. La pregunta es, ¿qué? Dice, Sorry, I'm getting the question translated here. Perdón. La pregunta es, ¿qué? Uh, ese era un comentario nada más. Ok, pero no entiendo. Está... Sea, te están haciendo el comentario de eso, que ascendieron a, su, a una a otra persona en vez de a él antes que a su, aunque él ya había cumplido el reglamento. Oh, Entonces, y la otra persona no. Ajá. I believe that the question is, what do I do? I have been following the career path that was laid out for me, and step by step completing the requirements so that I can achieve a new level. And Tootsie comes on the job and within two weeks, he's getting access to uh, the special servers, to accounts that are hands-off accounts, not having gone through the, the procedures and the steps that I have been very painstakingly and methodically going through. So what do I do? With something like that, If I'm doing the best I can at my job, it's very rare that I want to take the focus off of me and my goals and if I am or I'm not achieving them or where am I in, that, in, in, in the process to look at somebody else. Unless it is a situation such as if I'm in a sales department and I happen to know that Joe is the number one salesperson, then I want to keep a close eye on Joe so that Joe, so that I can see what he's doing, how I might be able to replicate the things that work for him and make them work for me as well. Apart from that, unless I'm specifically focusing on superstars in the organization uh, after which I would want to model my behavior, I recommend not paying attention to who is or is not you know, rising in the ranks. How did they get there so quickly without completing the steps? That would be in the category of none of my business because that is not me or my career path. And if I take my eye off my prize and focus it on what they're doing over there and how they got there, it's just gonna be a constant distraction and will not serve me at all. So that's my, <laughs> that's my I wouldn't say a thing about it because it's none of my business. Um, Shelly, hey Shelly, a new employee just got promoted to head cashier. Wait a minute, is that you or somebody else? New employee just got promoted to head cashier, yet management didn't follow the rules of new hire is supposed to be, oh, it I, sounds, like this, sounds like the question I just answered. Okay, yet management didn't follow the rules that the new hire is supposed to be in the position for six months before any upgrade on their position within the company. I think the question is what would I do or what would I say? And Shelly, it's, you know, sometimes the, the universe conspires in our favor and that was, along the same lines of what I just answered a moment ago. I wouldn't pay any attention to what somebody else is doing in the company unless you want to model your behavior after them. Therefore, if you do see somebody who you know, mysteriously was promoted to the head cashier who did not follow the regular protocol or the regular rules, the only thing I would do when I'm, if, if I were to shift my focus onto them at all, the only reason that would be possibly to see what are they doing that I might be able to replicate and make work for me if their goals that they seem to be achieving are also common goals of my own. So that's the only reason that I would pay any attention to that. And if they found a way to make some shortcuts, make them <laughs> if, if you're concerned about that. Pamela, I like what you said about stop taking things personally at work. Thank you, Pamela. Yeah, if at work, If we can use our workplace as a, I want to say like a, a laboratory or a testing ground where we simply step back and observe what's going on here and don't take anything personally because it is never, ever, ever personal at work. Even if it appears to be personal and somebody is direct, straight out attacking you, it's not personal because their motives, their, excuse me, their motivation, their reasons, their fears, We don't know anything about that or why they're saying what they're saying or what they're doing, why they're doing what they're doing. But what I do know is that it does not have anything to do with me. And the reason that I say that is because 
just as what you say and do, even if it is directed towards me, has nothing to do with me, is because how I respond to you and the, the manner in which I speak to you or communicate with you is going to be 100% a reflection of who I am and nothing more. And I want to keep that in mind because many times we all, you know, we all of us fall into this slippery, fall, start slipping down the slippery slope of reacting, you know, the reactionary behavior. I'm talking to you this way because you just talked to me that way. I'm saying this to you because you just said that to me. And if I am starting to communicate in reaction to the way you communicate, I mean, where does it end? What I'm doing is I'm pulling myself away from my goals and my aspirations and who I really am. And I'm simply reflecting the environment around me. Because remember, scientifically speaking, there's the uh, there is the law of what is it? The law of uh, okay, it's the law of I want to say tra tra uh, transference. Transference. When you take a, a teaspoon and you put it in a cup of coffee, that teaspoon is going to heat up and get hotter and hotter until it is the same temperature as the coffee. And the coffee is actually going to cool down a little bit until the coffee and the teaspoon are going to be the same temperature. That temperature transfers onto the spoon. That's always going on. Any object placed in any environment is going to start reflecting its environment, becoming like its environment, take on characteristics of its environment, start to walk and talk like its environment until the environment and the thing are more the same. I can't ignore certain laws of the universe that are going to apply in every situation, such as the law of transference. The properties of the difficult people at work are going to start to become my properties. The way that they communicate when other people are being negative or backstabbing or gossiping, I am either going to start to be more gossipy and backstabbing and you know conniving and <laughs> vindictive, or I'm going to transform that environment because we are always, always, according to the laws of the universe as we know them today, transforming or conforming. We're either transforming our environment or conforming to it. So we really have to make a decision and take a stand at work and decide when I walk in the door, what am I here to do? Am I here to mimic your you know, subpar behavior? Am I here to want, am I here to, reflect back on to all of you the worst of the qualities that tend to be revealed here at work? Or am I going to reflect who I really am and decide before I come into work who I am, why I'm here, and what I really want, which then will be reflected in the way that I communicate with you, which is why what I say to you has nothing to do with you. It doesn't matter how you're communicating with me. That is about you. How I communicate back to you it is all about me. Every word that I speak is a testament to the person I believe I am, nothing more. And that, if it's true in any situation, will be true in every situation. If it's true when I say to you, you know, I'm sorry when I said that, if I have to apologize, I apologize. That really had nothing to do with you. And I was having a bad day. I apologize. That was unfair what I said to you. You know, let's say that I said something horrible. That's a situation where we can all take responsibility and realize what I said to you just a moment ago had nothing to do with you and I apologize, it was all about me. It's always that way, just on different levels. So I wanna really pay attention to that and remember it because I don't wanna take things personally at work. When people are having a problem or uh, complaining about something or maybe even complaining about me, what they're complaining about or criticizing is the process maybe at work or the rules and regulations or a policy, or if they're directing it at me, it might be my position and something about the, the way things are done under my purview or under, you know, under, under my charge that they don't agree with. That's not personal. If you don't like the way something is being done and I'm a professional who can take responsibility for my own actions, meaning I'm doing things the way that I understand they are supposed to be done, well, then the problem you have isn't with me. It is with the procedure or the thing or the 
policy at work. So let's talk about that and don't take it personally. And if you believe that somebody's personally attacking you, they are not. So let that go. Okay. <laughs> yes. Tengo un gerente por encima de mí que hace comentarios poco profesionales sobre los empleados y los gerentes subordinados debajo de ella. ¿Cuál es una forma de decir que no quiero formar parte de eso? Okay, I have a supervisor who is saying unprofessional things about the other employees, my coworkers basically, in front of me all the time and I don't want to be a part of that. So how do I tell my boss I don't want to engage in that type of gossip or backstabbing? Frequently at work, the most difficult things to do are the simplest of all. It's not really the words that are difficult. It's making the decision to say something to your boss, such as, you know, I would appreciate it if we would keep the conversations at work to a professional tone. Meaning if you have some criticism that you want to deliver about that employee, that you would deliver it to that employee. Or if there's some reason I need to hear it, then I would like that employee to be present as you tell me if it's about that employee, but delivering criticism that's really about somebody else to me doesn't seem to serve any purpose here. And I don't feel that that would fall within the range of professional communication. And I would appreciate it if we would keep our communication here at work professional. So that's the way I might say it. You can say it however you want, but it's not really the words that are the difficult thing to you know decide how to say. It's deciding, if I say that to that boss, I might be out of the loop, right? You know, I might be now not part of their little club, <laughs> you know? So I might miss out on something that maybe would benefit me if I knew it. That's really the tough decision. And if you've ever done it, I will guarantee you, when you have to say something like that to your boss, and what you're basically saying is, oh, this is embarrassing for you. I don't think you were there for the lesson on what really is and is not professional communication. Now, I wouldn't say it like this, but this is what it's going to sound like if you were to tell your boss, hey, Charlie, I'm uncomfortable. Here's what I might say. Charlie, I'm uncomfortable with those types of remarks that are really critical of my coworkers if they're not here to defend themselves. So if we could keep our conversations to a strict professional tone, that would really make my life easier here at work. You know, if I were to say something like that, what I'm really telling my boss is, you don't know how uncool that is to gossip about your employees with another employee. So let me tell you that that's not cool. And when you, when you deliver that message, if you are to do it in a professional, straightforward, clear way, you know, such as Charlie, I have to stop you there. It makes me uncomfortable when you deliver criticism about other employees to me and not in front of them. So if you have something critical to say about the other employees here, could you please make sure that they are present when you say that? That would help me make sure that I'm keeping my conversations, even when they're with you, to a professional level. Could you do that for me? Now, if I were to say something like that, what that's really telling the boss is, dude, I can't believe that you're doing that. So why don't you raise your level of communication up from the gutter and, and stop gossiping about your employees with other employees? When you do that, you know, if you make that decision to just tell somebody in a very clear, professional way, not something like, now, pay, this is, this is the, the big point I would like to make with this question. Sometimes we will, because these conversations are uncomfortable, we will say to a boss something like, hey, Charlie, boundaries, you know, or we'll say something like, hey, dude, that is not cool. And we're not being clear with our communication. What I want to do is state the behavior that you are engaging in and what I would like you to do instead. Charlie, when you criticize other employees like that and they're not around, it makes me uncomfortable. That's the effect of your, be of your behavior. So if you're going to talk about them, I'd appreciate it if they were here to defend themselves, or we can leave that out of our conversations altogether. If you're clear and upfront like that, they will so respect you more, and they will now be on the alert that you are not a simple run-of-the-mill employer employee who will 
bend their own rules and moral compass <laughs> so that they might fall into favor with a supervisor. I mean, those types of people who will do that, you know, who will compromise their principles and listen to the gossip so that they can, you know, be part of the special club, they are a dime a dozen. It is the one who will say, hey, I'm uncomfortable with talking about my employers or my fellow employees when they're not here to defend themselves. Could we leave that out of our conversations, please? It is those people who will be on a totally different level and who will actually have more respect, even if it's not as much, you know, gossip time with their boss, I would rather have the respect of my boss. And that's how you get it by letting the boss know, hey, Tootsie, you know you're breaking the rules, so stop doing that, okay? That's not cool, <laughs> but be very specific about that. Uh, Jokdan, did you have another question? Okay. Hazel eyes, hazel eyes. Keep... Oh. Oh, thank you, thank you. <laughs> there, are, did you think I had died? Uh, I actually looked up one time on YouTube. I'm like, Dan O'Connor. And it, people were asking, is Dan O'Connor dead? I did not die. Uh, <laughs> everything's going great. I've actually been working on a new website. If some of you haven't seen it, my website has gotten a complete makeover. And I have done some new pro I've been working on some projects lately. And it's really difficult for me. If you know me, you know that time management, scheduling, <laughs> organization, prioritization is not my strong suit. And so it's difficult for me to keep things going uh, on a regular kind of churn, to keep things going out as they normally have when I take on new projects. And so when I take on a new project, everything else tends to just get thrown out the window as I complete that new project. So that's all I've been doing. And uh, we are back and I'm gonna be committed to, Joktan, how many, cuantos videos in YouTube debemos poner una cada semana? Deberíamos poner dos, pero siempre ponemos uno a veces cada mes. <laughs> okay, I am committed to putting out two YouTube videos a week for the next month. Okay, that's my new project. So just so that you don't think I'm dead. I don't want to Google myself and have Dan O'Connor dead pops up in Google. Okay. Would it be horrid? This is from Pamela Macha. Hey, pa oh, hey, Rambo. Rambo 89. Rambo, that looks like you are, you look like my nephew, uh, Maddie. Is that you, Maddie? If it is, hello. Uh, Pamela Macha. Would it be horrid to say all the perfect people went somewhere else to work? No, nah, not so good. <laughs> okay. Okay, Pamela, I'm glad that you mentioned that because what Pamela was doing is saying, you know, how about that I say something to my boss like, oh, all of the perfect people have gone someplace else to work. There's nothing inherently bad about that, except for <laughs> the, we always want to strive to be as clear as possible with our communication at work, clear and direct. And so when we're not clear and direct, but instead we are making a point by saying something, you know, like making a comment like that. We're just not being upfront and clear in our communication. Like what we probably meant to say is everyone has defects and flaws and it's actually a good thing to recognize them instead of trying to shame people when they have them or hide them. We can all learn from one another's flaws. You know, if that's what I mean to say, say that because it's really difficult to find fault in a communicator who simply is clear and honest and direct with their communication. But I'm not saying that that is, <laughs> that is the way I communicate 100% of the time. That's the goal. We should just be clear as to what the goal is. And I'll be more likely to communicate that way tomorrow if I'm clear as to what the goal is today. But I don't think any of us are perfect communicators, except for my mother. But, you know, she's dead. I mean, you know. Kinda. Hazel eyes, keep up your work ethic. They're jealous because it obviously. Okay, now I think pucking is probably a spell check uh, or instant corrector. And I'm not really sure what you're saying just Moy, but I appreciate the comment and the support. Uh, hey Tay, hey. Hey Tay, you know Tay, I think I just saw a couple of your comments today that I was going to respond to. Remind me what they were, if that's you, and I'll respond to them right now. Thanks for this great advice. You're welcome, Julie. Hi, Julie. Uh, and Just Moy. Hey, Beth. Okay, now, <laughs> Just Moy is saying that somebody needs to find another job. 
that sometimes is the case where we are working someplace and you know the, it's just too toxic and the cost benefit analysis really doesn't pan out for me staying in my job. However, here's the word of warning. If there's some issue that's being brought up in you, which is what any of these issues really are, it has nothing to do with anybody else. It's always about us. So if something's being brought up in me at this job and whatever it is, it's something that I need to work through and it's going to keep getting brought up in me until I work through it. If I quit my job and do not work through it, you know what it's like. It's going to come up in the next job where we'll be like, oh my gosh, this again? You know what this is like. Uh, hold on. Tay, <laughs> because Tay, you know how when you're dating somebody and you think, I just can't do this anymore. You know, I, 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 I'm sorry, but you haven't worked in six months. I can't do this. So I'm going to dump you before really working through this whole issue of how do I keep getting set up as the caretaker of these other people? And so let's say that you just dump somebody and you're like, I'm not dating anybody without a job anymore. <laughs> and so then, then you start dating somebody else. They have a great job. They, you, you have met their employers and have had personal and professional references. They're, they, they've checked out. And then like three weeks later, before you know it, you're like, hey, wait, wait a minute. What, what, ha, ha, come on. How did you get unemployed again? Because you are bound. The universe is a cruel mistress and she makes sure that we learn our lessons. We can't move past a lesson until we complete it. You just can't. So if you try to skip a lesson and just quit a job, dump you know, what your partner, fire somebody, the same issue will come up again in a different actor, same role. So beware of that. You know, if you are going to quit a job because it's too toxic, work through that and let the people there know, you know, instead of just quitting and saying, ah, you know, screw you all. Letting people know. Before I leave, I would like you to know here's why that you lost here's why you lost somebody that may or may not have been what you might consider you know the most productive employee ever here's what I was bringing to the table and what I'm not going to be bringing to the table and here's why because of these you know these issues so if you wanted to avoid losing somebody like me in the future that would be something you'd want to work on maybe that will help you work through that issue I don't know you will know because you will feel good about it once you work through something, you feel good. That's the judge. And I wanted to bring that up specifically because we were talking about, today I was talking to some personal clients about forgiveness and what, are, what role that plays in the workplace. Uh, and I'm glad that I talked to her about this because she, was, she works in a huge, huge technical company, uh, tech-based company. And she said that in her position where she's right below the... CEO, forgiveness, being able to both ask for it and give it is one of the top qualities that she believes anyone in a position of that level needs to have and will have helped them get to that position. Even though it's a technical skills, technical based company, forgiveness, patience, communication skills are the skills that get you to the high levels in those companies. Um, I am in Mexico. Who asked that? Can you ask Como? Uno, dos. Uno, dos. Uh, I am today in Mexico. I'm in the, nestled in the bosom of the Sierra Madre here with Joktan. And I'm not sure when I'm going back to the States because I took kind of a prolonged uh, pandemic stay, I guess, in my Mexican home instead of in the U.S. to ride out the, the COVID, I guess. So I am just about done riding it out. And I actually am going to be back touring uh, on live on the road soon, within a couple of months here. ¿Sabes cuando voy a...? No, you don't know. But soon I will be back on the road. If anybody is looking for a live event or a keynote speaker, or a workshop leader or something like that for an upcoming event, let me know if you feel as though I would be a good fit for what you're looking for. Um, one second. Pandora, 
Love your name. Hooray. Hi, Rhonda. Looking forward to that, Dan. Thank you, Pam. I'm not sure what you're looking forward to. So you're back in Mexico. I am. Ginger. Ginger, hello there. I use your tips on my children. That's wonderful. Before I read your more of your question, please, I sometimes forget to clarify that. Any good communication tactic or strategy that you can use at work, you should be able to use at home. If you can use it at home, you should be able to apply it at work. Uh, in fact, most of the communication strategies that I develop, if I have you know, named it, uh, if I've developed the scripting for it, come from parenting resources that I'll use. Because when we want to modify children's behavior, the same strategies, you know, the basic psychological tools that we would use to reward positive behavior and, and try to dissuade people from engaging in negative behavior are the exact same tools that we would use with adults. You know, there's no difference. So thank you for that comment. And one second. Um, I'm so jelly. And don't forget to try. <laughs> I don't, one, two. You know, I don't know what you're talking about. Um, uh, I've become much more graceful. Who said that? Shaga baby. You know, that's, uh, that touched me, Shaga baby. You become more graceful. Is that my sister-in-law, Michelle? Is that you? Uh, not that you needed any grace. I'm just asking, but that is wonderful. And I am glad that I could help in any way, bring more grace into your life. Um, would you, oh, that is a sign from God, Jeanette S. Jeanette, hey mom, Jeanette S just commented, will you ever be coming to Australia? And just last night, I never will forget, Jeanette, I was talking to my mother about where we should do our next live retreat. And she scoffed and was aghast and agog when I said it should be in Australia because I have a connection with Australia. I'm like the David Hasselhoff of communication training in Australia. And I thank you for that suggestion and I'm going to be working towards that because I think that's confirmation. Okay, did you ever see the movie, The Judge? Robert Duvall plays the father. Um, Robert, uh, is, is, mom, are you writing these comments and pretending that you're other people? Diane Lamorticella. You ever see the movie The Judge? Robert Duvall plays the father and a judge and Robert Robert Downey Jr. was his son, a lawyer. My mother just forced me to watch the ending of that the other day when I was at her house. And uh, so, yes, I saw the, the end of it. It looked kind of like a Hallmark, you know, movie of the week, <laughs> but she loved it. And I thought that the ending was interesting. You know, I, I, I did. So thanks. Yeah. <laughs> okay. You've been helping me with a challenging coworker. This is from JL. I'm grateful and considerate, no coincidence, to have found you. Thank you, JL. I have found you. What if you experience retaliation from, wait a minute, where did this go? From this approach. Ooh, Ivar Belot. What a pretty name. Uh, I'm, I'm sure I'm massacring it, but it looks like it should be pronounced in a very pretty way. Uh, what if you experience retaliation from this approach? I'm not sure what you're talking about. So if you could elaborate on that, I would be happy to answer that. And uh, retaliation, that's it's one for the next, next episode. Okay, I wish I had found Dan when I was teaching. I've shared videos with friends still teaching. My middle school students needed to hear your lessons. Thank you. I was just PJ Williams. Uh, I was just talking with my business associates, you know, my mother, about, tell me what you think about this. I don't know why, but I am like a magnet for people on the spectrum. Uh, most of my intimate relationships are with people on the spectrum. I don't know why. And there's some chord that I tend to hit just right for people who are either have Asperger's or are some someplace on the spectrum with uh, autism. And I am drawn to the autistic brain and it seems as though I can, uh, I have some type of way of speaking that gets through to people on the spectrum in a different way from how other people might say the same message. And I was, re I was considering recently putting together kind of a website or a program specifically for not just 
grade schools, because a lot of teachers do use my uh, programs in their classroom, but for people on the spectrum, you know, communication skills for uh, no matter where you are on the spectrum. So tell me what your thoughts are on that. And depending on what your feedback is, that might, you know, help me put more or less energy into that project. Hello from the UK. Being in employment, the majority of the time is like evolution of man, but in reverse. Thank you, Trite76. Uh, being in employment is the majority of the time, like the evolution of man, but in reverse. I think I know what you're saying. Uh, okay, Danny J live now. Hey, Danny J, thank you for your amazing content. Do you have recommendations for folks with social anxiety to help apply your techniques while keeping strategic wits about you? Oh gosh, yes. I have to tell you, Danny J live now. I am, I have a lot of social anxiety and I have a lot of challenges just communicating with people because I get, I, you, anyone who knows me and who's a friend of mine or in my family knows that I'm impossible to get on the phone because I have phone fear and I have just anxiety about, you know, meeting new people and having to sit down and make small talk, which is why I have had to force myself to learn all of these techniques so that I can function, you know, as a normal person. Uh, and when I deliver speeches, I don't know how I got into public speaking, uh, but when I have to deliver a speech or a present, give a presentation, it's having that structure that helps me get through the anxiety. So what I would recommend is finding a, a few good tactics that would be duct tape tactics for you. Like, uh, you know, what are, the, what are the common situations that you find yourself in where you are, have a lot of anxiety? Find some really concrete, simple tools that you can use even when emotions run high that you'll be able to remember and access. And I give you tips on how to do this in my, any one of my courses. Uh, so that you can master just a few things, you know, just a, a few, maybe it's opening lines so that when you sit down at a table of people, you will be able to, you'll always be nervous. And that's, by the way, one thing that I want people to take heart in. If you're nervous and you have a lot of anxiety when you speak in front of a crowd or even a crowd could be one person, many people get disillusioned and stressed out because they just read a book or watched a video on how to speak in public without anxiety. And they just tried the tactics or the, str the strategies and they still have anxiety. And so they feel like, oh, I'm a failure again. That didn't work for me. If you ever see a video or a, a, a course on how to speak in public without anxiety, don't even waste your time on that. Because if you have anxiety, you will always have anxiety. The reason I'm telling you that is not to make you afraid of, you know, in the future, oh my God, it'll never go away. Don't expect it to, because then you're setting yourself up for disappointment and you'll be like, oh, I can't even diminish my anxiety like that lesson said I would. You will never diminish it. What you'll be able to do, however, is work through it. If you have strategies that you know will work for you, even if you're super nervous to help you get the words out of your mouth, after a few times of using them in these high stress situations, you'll be so confident in your skills that that will outweigh the amount of anxiety that you have. You know, confidence and anxiety are just two different, are they emotions? They're two different states, I guess, that we would find ourselves in. You know, I'm either anxious or I'm confident. And you just have to get to the point where the confidence outweighs the anxiety. The anxiety level will always be the same, especially if you care about what you're saying. You know, I'm I'm so stressed out before I give public speeches or keynotes that I have these visions of like pulling the fire alarm and you know maybe then we could all just go home and I could deliver this speech over a recorded Zoom session because I get so nervous. But it's because I really care about what I'm gonna say and how it's gonna impact people. And if that's the case with you, that will always be there. But the confidence outweighs that. You know, it's kind of like when you uh, when you lose somebody, if you've ever had anybody die or even a pet, that grief will never diminish, you know, will always stay there, but you find a place for it and everything else will eventually outweigh it so that you can keep going. So when, on some small level, when you deliver a speech, it's like getting over grief, you know what I mean? So it can be difficult, just practice three strategies that you can use over and over again until you are so confident in them that you think, oh my gosh, now I'm gonna learn three more and then you'll see where you can go. Okay, informally, she calls me up. Now I think, by the way, Joktan, ¿cuánto tiempo tenemos? Ya se llevamos, ¿cuánto tiempo llevamos? Ajá. Uh -huh. 
Oh, I have five minutes left. Um, Gary, the pragmatist, needs my guidance. Okay, Gary, I'm all ears. Uh, informally, she calls me up. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Okay, Gary, somebody calls you up and tries to make you believe it is an us versus them situation. And she's got crazy with the WFH situation. She's got crazy with the what fuck? What, what, oh, excuse me, what? Okay, I don't know what that message is. <laughs> Gary the Pragmatist, if you could elaborate a little bit, I will be happy to uh, respond to that. I just don't get what's the F WFH. And if that's like some super common phrase, I'm so out of the loop, I just, I, I couldn't be any further out of the loop. So <laughs> don't, don't assume I know. Small talk, ugh. David, I'm telling you, Small talk is the pits, especially if you're not, you know, by nature, a social person, which is why if you just, here's small talk all comes down to this. If you are the person who, when you meet somebody can put your shoulders back, your chin up, extend your arm and say, hi, I'm Dan. What's your name? That's it. You know, you replace your name with Dan, but if you can extend your hand confidently and say, hi, I'm Sally or I'm Dan, I'm, I'm Joktan. What's your name? That is it. In, in that one 10 second stretch, if you can do that, people will be so floored. They'll be like, who is that? They are CEO material. Just because you know how to introduce yourself. It makes everybody else so at ease. You know, when you are the one who's, who's able to introduce yourself and say, give me that piece of information. I'm going to give you first mine. I'm Dan. What's your name? Then you get that. People are like, oh, God, thank you so much. Thank you so much. I didn't know how to do that. I don't know how to do introductions like that. I just don't know. So master that, and all of a sudden, small talk will be a breeze for you, uh, especially when you just learn a few different lead-in lines and closing lines and transitional phrases. Super easy. Um, I work at a bank, and hence, it is really challenging to tackle this situation like I would have with my male boss, so more, more so with remote working. Okay, Gary the Pragmatist. The pra <laughs> Gary the Pragmatist. Pragmatist, I, I can't speak anymore. If you could send me an uh, like an email on that question you were asking, I'm not getting it. I'm getting pieces of it, and I have to wrap up. I will answer that either uh, in a video or uh, in an email or in our, in our next live Q and A session. And Ginger, high functioning autistic fifteen year old girl who monologues for long periods of time. Ginger, yeah. I was just talking with somebody uh, who had a similar issue. Many times, especially when you're on the spectrum, it's the cues that they're not getting. You know, they don't, they, they're not able to pick up social cues and the significance of them, the definition of them, and then what to do next. That's the key. You know, like even if you teach somebody who otherwise would not be able to grasp it naturally, that, you know, when somebody scratches the back of their neck, that means they're not really understanding what you're saying. That's half of it. What that means is you want to stop what you're saying, go back, repeat it in a different way, slow down a little bit, use different wordings or diff, you know, use different words, use a different tone, and then ask periodically, I think there's something I'm missing or that I'm leaving out. What is it? That will help people who didn't understand you, get, gain the understanding that you would want them to have. That's what I mean when I say we want to tell people not what things mean, but what to do then. You know, when you notice this, see this, do that. Therefore, when somebody is monologuing too much, one of the reasons I have found is they don't know what the cues are that would tell other people, stop and <laughs> pass it on to somebody else. So what I found worked for one client of mine was giving that person who monologues a lot very specific closed-ended questions to ask. Here's I'll get into here's why. When you are monologuing, 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 it's kind of like I don't know. I, I can't I can't find the this the stop button. I don't know. What's the cue that I should be looking for or using that will help me come to a natural stop? Therefore, what you want to, therefore, if you give 
people who have this challenge, specific questions that are closed-ended questions and sometimes tag questions. Closed-ended questions are going to be things like, I want to give you, I want to give you a good one so that you can use it. What do you think about that so far? Does that sound good to you? Would you agree with what I'm saying? What do you have to add to that? Is there anything that you think I've left out? Questions like that, you can throw in just about anywhere you are. If you're monologuing, 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 and you want a, a kind of a, a safe place to, when you're questioning, am I, model, am I going on too far here? Teach that person who monologues to occasionally, even if it does not seem like a natural place to stop. If you have those types of questions, what am I leaving out? Or is there anything you would like to add? Is what I'm saying, uh, I don't want to say making sense because that, that's the danger phrase. Questions like that. Is there anything you would like to add? Those types of questions, you can stop no matter where you are. Like, is there anything you'd like to add? No matter where you are, you can stop throw out those questions. And if the person that you throw the question to responds with, yes, there is something I'd like to add or starts to talk, then you know that was where you wanted to stop. You know, that was enough because they're waiting to, to participate in this conversation with you. So yes, if somebody's a monologuer, you want to give them the tools that help them stop. That's, that's really the challenge is they get in a role and they don't know how to stop. You can stop anything you're saying with a question. Do you have anything to add so far? How is what I'm saying sounding to you up to now? Is there anything that I have left out? Any type of clarifying question like that, you can stop, ask it, and that helps give the person in their mind the feeling like, yes, this is where I'm stopping because I'm now passing the, the ball to the other person. And it makes sense for me to say that sentence and then stop speaking because I've just asked you a question. I'm going to wait for you to respond to that. If the other person now says, no, I'm good, then you know, monologue it is, and you can keep going. But yes, when somebody's a monologuer, give them the tools that help them find or create natural stops. And then the way to do that is pass it to find a way to use those stops. It could be, like I said, tag questions, closed-ended questions, to then pass that on to somebody else. Then you will feel like, that makes sense that I'm stopping here. Otherwise, it won't make sense and they won't stop. I hope that helps. Um, <laughs> thank you, Brittany. Um, okay, I think that is it. I have to go. So you just got to work on your... It's all but... <laughs> I do have to work on my... Uh, oh, I thought you said company. <laughs> okay, I found redirecting negative comments from a gossip of Nelly at work. Works wonders. Redirecting negative comments from a gossip monger or negative Nelly at work works wonders. I, I, I don't even understand English anymore. So with all of that said, um, I'm going to try to get through all of your questions, even if it's not here right now, because I have to go. Um, if you have any further questions, please send them to me either in the comment section or in a, if you send, if you send a video question, guaranteed, I will send you a video response on YouTube just for you. And other than that, you know, remember, above all else, Joktan, above all else. By the way, we got to get Joktan in here more. He's funny. We got to, we got, he's, he's way, way better looking than Andrew. <laughs> I'm joking. Nobody's better looking than Andrew. <laughs> but I'm joking. But uh, remember that the most important thing is to, especially now, more than ever before, no matter what you have to say to somebody, remember, What's the most important thing? There's nothing that I have to say that I can't say in a loving way. So be loving with one another. If you have any challenges finding loving words to say what you have to say, let me know. That's what I'm here for. And I will help you find those words. And for everyone here at Dan O'Connor Training, this is Dan O'Connor and Joke Time. Bye. Bye. Be loving. Goodbye. <laughs>